All right, cool. It is 11.15. We are going to get started. So news for the class today. Um, we did get problem set for graded. The scores have now been posted to Canvas. Um, even though this assignment was out of 90 points, um, it's going to be worth the same number of overall points, I guess 100, as the other problem sets. We just needed to um, take the percentage and upload it. Sorry for some confusion and some changing scores last night. Um, I decided to make two answers on the multiple choice correct, um, and that has led to um, a bit of time getting that adjusted. Other things I posted, um, all the solutions to the extra problems that were on the recommended problem list, um, solutions to problem set four, and solutions to the practice exam. So these are uploaded as documents or PDFs with sort of comments written in on Canvas. And I also posted uh, videos to YouTube where I went through each document and either worked through the problem explicitly or kind of described a bit more background about why that would be the correct answer. Um, I believe that's in a YouTube playlist called uh, like prep for exam four. And I'll probably put today's lecture into that um, into that playlist as well. Um, for those of you interested in information about the exam, um, it will be a little bit shorter than our other exams. As I mentioned, it's more designed for about 45 minutes rather than 50. Those will include 10 multiple choice. Now only four fill in the blank. We're still going to have two synthesis problems and we're only going to have one mechanism. So on the, um, on the practice test, we had two mechanisms and maybe five fill in the blanks. Um, similar to kind of what I've showed you uh, earlier, I'm going to have an exam template that will be uploaded as both a PDF and a document version. Um, I, I think we, we're gonna make separate versions for PC and Mac because they appear slightly differently just as the orientation can be all right. So if you are going, if you don't wanna take the time to print out the actual exam, I, um, recommend printing out the exam template to write into. This will help you get the answers in the right place and will make all the grade scope grading much easier. And I'll have some comments on uh, grade scope formatting and stuff in a minute. Um, so I'll have exam four released with the exam four folder in Canvas at 1115 sharp. So if you're there, you should be able to refresh the page and it will work. Um, we tested this out, I guess a week ago and th this seemed to work fine. Um, and then you'll have an hour and five minutes, so 20 extra minutes for processing to actually get it submitted to Gradescope. Um, if you are in a different, or if you have other accommodations, of course, you'd have more time. And if you're in a different time zone, you may be taking it at a slightly different time. And if you are in a time zone that will need accommodations, please send me an email and let me know. Um, since we always have periodic tables in class, feel free to print one out or have one available for reference. And feel free to have some extra scratch paper around. Usually we try to have enough space to answer all the questions and even with a little bit of work, but if possible, have clearly written answers on the exam. Okay, so before we get over some other uh, review topics, I did want to comment on Gradescope submission. Most of these worked really, really well, and thank you very much for getting everything in the right order. Um, but things that are very important for a Gradescope submission are the problem that you're working on having it being on the same page as um, the document that I, I provide. So if it's a multiple choice, put that on, that's on page one, it should be on page one. If it's a multiple choice question on page two, please put this on the second page. It's very easy to put a bunch of um, multiple choice answers on just one page and even more cramming it all into short space. Um, but this messes up everything on the back end. So just to kind of see an example of how we view the answers in Gradescope, um, when a page is scanned in, if the answer is in the correct position or even somewhat close, it'll detect um, where the writing is and it'll show us things like answers B. So this is all the different B answers as they appear. This lets us go and evaluate them as being correct or incorrect quickly. But you can see in some cases, if the page was not scanned in correctly, we do not see any answer at all. These, this is a line sheet of paper that was, I think, submitted um, in the wrong orientation. So this means we need to go manually go and search. So most of the time we're able to do this. If it's on a completely wrong page, that is, makes it way more difficult. 
But this is why I'm trying to give us enough options to get answers mostly in the right place, just so that um, the TAs and myself are not uh, scanning through documents trying to find answers just to be able to grade them. So I think this mainly reiterates this same idea. Um, and also, try to write your answers clearly, especially on problem sets. I think there's there's not a time constraint, so having things neat and, you know, you have plenty of space, making things legible is good. And if you cannot see your own answer when you take the image to submit, this means we can't either. So there was only a couple cases of this where we really could not see the writing that this, the students had, um, and that made it very difficult to grade. Um, Are there any questions about the exam or these elements right now at the moment? I am seeing no responses, so I'm just going to keep going, I guess. So there were a couple questions uh, that were posted on Piazza, um, I guess, very early this morning um, or last night, depending on how you view it. So I was just going to go comment on some of those, um, address those questions and answer these as well. So one question was on the practice exam, uh, multiple choice seven. It says, which of the following will be the product of the following reaction? And their question is, you know, if there's one equivalent of a mean, one equivalent of the alkyl iodide, why wouldn't it be B? because each of these include one and one. So I think part of this distinction is that when, when we talk about equivalence, um, equivalence means a stoichiometric equivalence. This is, this is not um, like one molecule and one molecule because you never can isolate a single molecule to have a reaction take place. We're only talking about the relative quantities. So you could say that you have, you know, one, one equivalent would be the same as saying, you know, you have, you know, one million of this molecule and one million of another molecule. So they're the same ratio. Um, so we saw this same sort of equivalence concept, I think, in past sections where we talked about this. Um, and a, an organo metal addition to things like esters. And so in this case, um, we can go and have maybe an example to highlight why we end up making mixtures by at least showing maybe oops, what, what could happen if we had maybe three different amines and three molecules of ethyl iodide. So all these reactions are not going to happen at the exact same time, so there is going to be a statistical element to the problem. So that means at some point in time, the first one will react, and it will make some of the secondary amine B. Why can I not? There we go. And now this is in our reaction mixture. We now have a secondary amine along with two primary amines competing for the same um, ethyl iodide. And it could be that still the next reaction that takes place will also go to the correct product, or not the correct product, the, the next step. So now all of this is consumed. All of these reagents are consumed. So now we have two secondary amines versus one primary amine competing for one alkyl iodide. So secondary amines are actually a little bit more nucleophilic and a bit more reactive than the primary amine. So it's very possible that this could end up reacting again instead of the primary amine. Whenever you're talking about, you know, incredibly large number of molecules that would be going into any given reaction, then you could have the possibility of even 
over alkylation to quaternary ammoniums in the same mixture and pretty much get a little bit of everything along the way. So even from here, looking from this sort of statistical perspective, we would still end up making three different molecules left over at the end of the reaction, where we still have, probably have some starting material, some overalkylated, and maybe the thing you're trying to make, which is this secondary amine. I hope this clarifies that a bit. Why wouldn't you make the last one D? Um, you, you probably would. It's just with an example with only, um, that would be a situation where we had the secondary amine initially outcompete. My example with just three different molecules um, isn't representative of a real situation. D if, would be the least probable if you had a one-to-one -one equivalent ratio. But I would say that it, if you had a true distribution starting from millions of primary means and millions of alkyl iodides, you would make percentages of the quaternary ammonium along the way. So the one where I have three molecules and three molecules isn't um, perfect. Cool. But I think it does show how we can get some of these overalkylated and statistical outcomes. So the next question was on problem set um, number three, and they're asking, why wouldn't E also be a um, very electrophilic molecule? Oh, if it asked for the major product, um, I probably wouldn't ask that type of question, but I think it's reasonable to ask. Um, with a one-to-one -one ratio, the major product will probably be B. Will probably be this product, um, because that. But it would all depend on statistics, and statistics still probably favors B, since you can't really determine very easily how much more reactive this secondary mean is versus a primary mean. Um, it would be a little bit tricky. That's a good question. All right. Going back to problem set four, number three. Um, if we're trying to think about how fast do things react, um, the main factor we want to look at is how stabilized is the ground state of the carbonyl. So back in the lecture, we, we had this sort of diagram here shown. And this shows a hypothetical reaction of hydroxide with things like an amide versus an acid chloride. So we know acid chlorides react with like everything. This is very, very reactive. We know amides are the least reactive, at least of that subset we looked at at the time. And so we're trying to understand uh, energetically why do acid chlorides react so much faster. And what it comes down to actually is not that it has a more energetic transition state or intermediate. These are actually quite similar in energy. They both involve a carbon atom with a or a single oxygen atom that's stabilizing negative charge. So these have similar energy levels. The things that's different is the amount of resonance going in to stabilize the molecule. So this is the delta E that actually will make the difference in rate, because how hard is it for something to go from a low energy here all the way up to this energy is much more difficult than something that starts off at a higher, higher level. And this simply comes down to a resonance argument. In the case of an amide, this resonance stabilizes the overall molecule and makes it go down. So even though this oxygen is going to be electronegative, it's still going to act as a resonance donor, where this can add in. And this other oxygen will also be able to contribute electron density whereas an ester only has a single oxygen that's able to donate its charge. This is similar to the case back in topic two, when we had, say, methoxy-substituted benzene rings. Even though oxygen is very electronegative, its lone pairs are very good at donating charge to do reactions at either the ortho 
or parasites. So even though oxygen is electronegative, it's a very, very good um, pi donor through resonance. And if you consider these other ones, these each have either two or one nitrogens that will be better at donating resonance. Yes, the nitrogen would be a better pi donor than oxygen, which is why all of these would definitely be slower. Whereas, and the reason that B is slower than A is that it's just more sterically hindered. To answer Layla's question, the more resonance, the more stable, the slower it reacts. Especially, yes, that is true with nucleophiles. So if we're trying to have something like a negatively charged nucleophile attack this system, then this charge will be going and making a tetrahedral intermediate that now disrupts all that resonance stabilization. No, no, E is, is slower. A is definitely the correct answer here. Someone was asking why E was slower. And so E has more electron donating groups, which will lower the ground state energy. So it'll be lower in this sort of potential energy surface than a normal ester would be. Uh, this one's asking for the best electrophile. So if we want to compare D and E, now we have two nitrogen atoms. The nitrogen atoms are much better electron donors because we can put the positive charge on a nitrogen now. So this will probably be the slowest of all. Yeah, this is, this is mainly asking us what is the best electrophile. Since we say which one reacts fastest, um, this brings kinetics into it. Um, and so then you can start thinking about steric effects a bit more in terms of reaction rates. But in a lot of these types of reactions, whether it's acid-based chemistry or nucleophilic attack, um, just imagining what is changing in the molecule before and after the reaction will usually give you that difference. And in all of these cases, we end up going to a tetrahedral intermediate that has the same general form. We have a nucleophile attacking with an O minus. So this stays constant throughout. These, these groups will change a bit, but they don't impact the energetic state of this intermediate very much. So the thing that's different is how much of how much um, resonance is this nucleophile breaking up along the way? And the bigger that energy penalty, the more uh, the slower the reaction will be. Yes, the lone pair of nitrogen is better at at donating electrons than oxygen because nitrogen is less electronegative. So it's better at putting the positive charge on the nitrogen. And this also correlates as to how we view sometimes reactivity of things like iminiums are going to be less reactive than something like an oxonium. Because this oxygen really wants to get its electrons back. Um, to the person who just wrote a message on Piazza, I can address this. Um, it says, in the video you post reviewing solutions for problems at four, you said that you would accept answers C and E on number four. When will this be updated on Gradescope and Canvas? Oh, I wonder if I accidentally made question. I'll go double check. I thought this is what we sorted out last night. Um, I'll double check. 
this is the one that I thought I altered already, and this is why people were confused online. So I'll double check this after class and make sure all of the grades are, are still in line. It may have been marked incorrect, but I gave you credit for it. But I'll, again, I'll, I'll go, I'll go see. I could have given actual, maybe I chose the wrong one to make E correct. We're still learning how to use Gradescope a bit. So please give us some time to hopefully make everything work well. Okay, are there any other questions people have right now about the exam, about a specific question? Um, if there's nothing, I can generally just kind of go through the problem set briefly right now and kind of highlight some key mistakes. Um, if you don't have time, if we don't have time to go through all of them, I have, I have one about to post it. Sorry. Cool. And I will give this a moment. And anything we don't get to, hopefully, it can be addressed in the videos. I think I went through most of the um, options, tried to mention mistakes along the way, or explain at least the general rationale. Are you going to post this on the chat? or on Piazza, just so that I can. OK. If anyone has anything else in the meantime, I have a general question. For reductions of amides, do you need two molecules to reduce one amide molecule? Usually, you'll have an excess of lithium aluminum hydride to reduce amides. Um, yeah, let me see if I can go back to, I don't have this on my, we go to the mechanism. There's some cases where it does sort of like an intramolecular delivery and an, but that's more in the case of like a nitrile where like the same molecule will donate two hydrides and lithium aluminum hydride is able to give more than one of its hydrides as a nucleophile. Frequently we will go and, um, Um, I was just going to see if I can bring something up real quick. It'll take too long. Because this was in lecture 25, I believe, where we have... In the end, if you just write lithium aluminum hydride and an amide, you'll be fine for writing an answer. Um, in the reaction, we usually draw a second molecule coming in. Whether that is actually the same molecule is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I just now found it, 5, 535. Um, I would say there's never a case that if you write lithium aluminum hydride, we'll assume there's enough to do the reaction fully. Because I, I usually don't even specify that there's going to be um, excess lithium aluminum hydride unless there's potential for it to react with another part of a molecule. Just to clarify, there might be more than one reaction taking place. Um, the actual equivalence needed is a bit harder to determine. Because we make some byproducts that can be reactive whether or not those initial byproducts are still reactive enough to keep going is hard to tell. Sure. So I guess there's um, a couple different cases. He said when we're reducing Amides. I'm going to say quenching reactions of 
lithium, aluminum hydride, and amides. So for, I mean, I think this is mainly an issue with one that it has at least one hydrogen here, because this is when you end up um, making a lithium salt. Along the way, we're going to have an intermediate addition. We could say that this is bound to an aluminum hydride. And then this ends up getting ejected. And there's proton transfers, loss of hydrogen. I just want to get to everyone on the same page for how we're about to visualize the intermediate that is there. We'd have an R. We only have an R in the nitrogen. Then we're going to have lithium aluminum hydride one more time. Now we've put two hydrogens next to the nitrogen, removing the carbonyl. And so this is how I drew the molecule in class. And really, you can think about this a couple of different ways. Um, you can think about this as being a nucleophilic bond that could directly go and react with water. That will then give just a primary mean. And along the way, you would make what's called allane. So this is a neutral molecule, and this would do further reactions with water to eventually give aluminum hydroxide. Um, that might be the easiest way. Th this, this general um, bond here is still, you can view as being fairly ionic. It's more stabilized than an actual amide, but it's a lot like this. So you can just imagine having the bond take a hydrogen away. Does this does this kind of clarify? Was this the the question? This uh, nitrogen aluminum bond in green. Cool. Okay. Now we have incoming questions everywhere. Can you explain the steps for monomer and polymer problems in topic five? Okay. Now I have a lot of Piazza questions. So so my my. Going forward in this class, if you guys can put the Piazza questions on not as I'm on right now, um, I can get it all loaded up and we can save a lot of time. Because now I am juggling people asking questions in the chat and also... Here. Okay. So steps for monomer to polymer problems. So going from monomers, uh, there's different ways we can do this. Let's do it this way. So I think the examples that I had and I'm just going to go back. I think this was something on the problem set just to be instructive. So if I go and I'm looking at how will these react, And we have some reagent along the way too. This could be, let's, let's say it's DCC and DMAP. So we know DCC and DMAP when we have a carboxylic acid and we have an alcohol around, this will go to make an ester. So now somewhere along the way, we're gonna end up making a polyester. You guys probably heard of polyesters before. And the first reaction that takes place will look like this. We'd end up with this molecule. Now this molecule can continue to react. You can either view it as different molecules of this reacting with itself, or keep adding ethylene glycols to this acid and carboxylic acids to this alcohol. 
But at the end of the day, what we're going to try to do is find what is the basic repeating unit. Along the way, the overall result of this is loss of water from the system. So we end up losing water, which actually gets into, incorporated to the DCC. And so the monomer unit we need to identify will essentially be this molecule, ethylene glycol, and this molecule, terephthalic acid, only with the loss of water. And you can choose to put the bonds wherever you want. Um, depending on the example, sometimes it's useful to maybe add two different monomers to one side so you have a little bit more flexibility in where you're going to draw your repeating unit. Um, so if we know we need to have exactly one of these ethylene glycol molecules, we can go and try to map out, okay, let's try to put one ethylene glycol molecule there. And then we know that we're going to lose water, so we're not going to have the oxygen of the terephthalic acid, but we will have this carbonyl, we will have the benzene ring, and we will have this other carbonyl. So we have our carbonyl, we have this other benzene ring, and we have the other carbonyl. So if this alcohol were to react, it would end up making an ester on the other side as well. So that means that this bond right here, in some ways, would be connected to a repeating unit that's exactly like this bond here. So this is where we want to make our bracket, so that if you were to imagine having this bond just reconnect to the other side continuously, it would keep making the same product over and over again. And we always write a little N in the corner to stand for repeating unit. Um, I'm not too focused on what these chain ends are, whether you had this fragment at the end, this just as easily could just be an OH group. That's cool too. Um, what I'm mainly looking for is do we have the right basic units inside the brackets, and did we use the right chemistry to make the bonds in the polymer chain? Does that clarify some of the polymerization process a bit more? Cool. Can you, can you please explain the PKA jump in the topic five PowerPoint. Um, there, I'm not sure if I know exactly which part of that. Can you reply to this again and clarify or give me a number? The PKA jump. We talk a lot about PKAs. I'm not sure exactly which one that is. So extra synthesis practice question two. So with, with DCC and ammonia, that is that will not be a problem. Um, you can't you cannot have overreactions between DCC and amines, um, and that's because you can't. Um, if you make an amide bond, oops. Let's say we made a primary amide from a carboxylic acid. ammonia and DCC, this lone pair is not nucleophilic. So it's really hard actually to get amines to react at nitrogen, and that's because of the resonance stabilization that's formed. This carbonyl group really takes all of its power away, and if you even try to protonate an amide, it'll protonate on the oxygen. So this will not be able to react with any activated electrophiles. This won't even really react with acid chlorides very well. So is that what you were, you were worried about potentially going and having an overreaction to make an imid? What should you have done? Oh, sorry, I was reading maybe and not. Th this answer looks this answer looks fine to me. You hydrolyze 
couple to an amine, you reduce to a primary amine, and then you make an amine. I think this, this, this answer should not have any issues. This does not happen. I'll put a big X through it. I'll put a red X through it. And similarly, you can't get condensations onto an amine as well. I'll, do a, I'll draw another reaction of this does not happen. You wouldn't be making something like uh, this. Because this, this carbon is not electrophilic. Cool. Aha. There is a follow-up. Can I explain the difference between pKa1 and pK... Okay, so this is the electrostatics question, I think. Slide 5, 6. Okay, this is, this is what I need. Yeah, I think this is the electrostatics question. I wanted to get the exact numbers, so I have to go find, there it is. There we go, okay, cool. No, red's bad, blue's nice. So we have a pKa of 1.2. That reflects the first ionization. And for the next ionization, this molecule now has a pKa of 4.2. So one thing we notice is that this is much lower than, this value is much lower than normal acetic acid. We have another molecule that also has two pKa's. So the first one is 4.2, a little bit lower than acetic acid. And we have a second ionization that's a little bit less acidic than acetic acid. So we're trying to understand, well, I guess there's, there's a couple of different factors. I think if you're talking about um, the big difference in jump, so going from here, from first to second, this has a change in pKa of 1.4, whereas this one has a change in pKa of three. So one question is, you know, why is this jump so much different? Why, are, why do these have very different um, pKa differences? And that's an electrostatic effect. So we have here two negative charges that are gonna be very close in space. And just like two poles of a magnet that are the same repel each other, this actually is another way that you can generate repulsion in a molecule. Having two negative char charges very close is, is fairly difficult to do. Whereas here, we have these two groups, and now these are going to be quite a bit more remote from one another. And that means that this electro electrostatic effect is going to be more reduced but it's still somewhat there. It's not like having two isolated molecules of uh, acetic acid on the molecule. So they still communicate to some extent between each other. This is farther away. And looking at the initial pKa's of why 1.2 is so low, that is because we can imagine this carboxylic acid having 
an electron withdrawing group attached to it. So this will be an inductive effect. We can't really uh, stabilize this negative charge through resonance to the other side, but it is an electron withdrawing group and it will help to inductively stabilize that first ionization. The second ionization now is also has some inductive benefits, but now we have this electrostatic repulsion that's also a component. Here we can see a more long distance inductive effect of this acid. So this is still you know, a little bit lower than acetic acid, and that's because there is actually an, a carboxylic acid a little bit farther down the molecule. Does that clarify the pKa jump? Well, I hope so. Let me check to see if we have others. Okay, this is resolved. And I'll check on the grading, make sure I did that. Oh, pyrolysis, pyrolysis of ammonium acetate. So I would say that this is something that you don't need to focus on much. Um, so if you have very, very simple ammonium salts, kind of like this. This comes from just the reaction of a carboxylic acid and ammonia. If you heat these up, you know, to more than 200 degrees C, which not a lot of molecules do, um, you end up making an amide. And along the way, you lose water. So this is highly impractical because a lot of molecules don't especially the ones that you know, like a uh, small molecule synthesis, um, the 200 degrees C will start to have a lot of other reactions take place. So I would recommend not trying to use this in synthesis problems. Um, it has some industrial relevance, so we mention it. Um, the way this probably works is that somewhere high, the, the two ions are coupled to each other, probably somewhere along the way, they become in space next to each other at 200 as both an actual amine and a carboxylic acid, and somewhere it's able to attack. These are arrows that we usually don't consider because they're not applicable in any normal situation. And it's really hard to study mechanisms like this at such a high temperature. And it's probably, there's this minor equilibrium, and when you're at 200, all the water goes away and eventually can push forward. But I'm gonna write this down, don't, use in synthesis problems. It is not, it actually doesn't work very well. Cool. Right. Any other questions that you guys have? Oh, can I go over carbodiimide coupling? Sure. To do that, I might go over to um, the practice exam solutions that I made, because this has some of it written out. Um, and I'll just write on top of this. So these are the ones that are posted. So for, for carbodiimide couplings, we have two different variants. One is with DCC, this carbodiamide in an amine. This does not require DMAP, and that's the mechanism that I'll, I'll go over right now. And I'll mention a, a brief consideration for reactions with alcohols in a second. So along the way, we're gonna have an acid-base reaction between DCC and the carboxylic acid coupling partner. So th this nitrogen is fairly basic, and it's able to be protonated by the hydrogen to give a carboxylate salt. Now we have, oh, a negatively charged carboxylate salt that can attack this sort of aminium-like species to give an intermediate. So this whole part of the molecule now is effectively your leaving group. It looks kind of like um, an anhydride if you cross your eyes a bit. 
but amines are nucleophilic enough that it can directly attack this carbonyl to make the tetrahedral intermediate. And then from the tetrahedral intermediate, you kick out the urea anion, and the urea, urea anion can proton transfer back to make the amide. Um, there's also a more concerted way to draw uh, loss of this leaving group, but it's Yeah, DCC is a type of carbodiimide. So the C here, oops, this C stands for carbodiimide, and it's dicyclo oops, hexyl carbodiimide. So dicyclohexyl carbodiamide. Does that clarify some of the carbodiamide coupling reaction, or do you have an additional question with regard to DMAP and alcohols? So the only difference here is that instead of an alcohol, if we had an alcohol, it can't directly react with this intermediate. This is not electrophilic enough we would have DMAP do its thing similar to um, acid and hydrides and couple it. We have a question about phosgene alcohol. What happens if there's only one molar equivalent of alcohol added? Okay, cool. So if we think about phosgene, this is very reactive. It's more reactive than your average acid chloride because we have two of them, so they're going to be inductive. Yeah, so DMAP is added for alcohols because alcohols aren't as nucleophilic as um, amines, and it helps it along. Every now and then you'll see people add DMAP to everything. People just out of habit add DMAP to reactions with amines too, even though it's not necessary. So if, if you're not sure whether to use DMAP or not, just, just write DMAP for any of these coupling reactions and, and you'll be safe. So this is very reactive. We have these chlorines that are polarizing. And these can directly react with, let's say, ethanol to eventually, with two equivalents, we know this will eventually do two substitution reactions, and we're going to make a carbonate. And the question is, what if we have one equivalent? And the one equivalent doesn't make anything too surprising. It makes what's called a chloroformate. And it's just a single addition product. Since there isn't um, a hydrogen on this alcohol, we can't kick out that last chloride like we did to make isocyanates. But we can actually go and stop here. Because already, as soon as we get to this first chloroformate intermediate, it's going to be less reactive. So we have this resonance donation stabilizing it. So you can do selective single or double additions to chloroformates. Here's an alternative question. So this is practice exam. We're looking at 13A. I brought in All right, I'm going to just try to erase all of this and see what happens. I'm just going to draw what I think you're saying. Okay, so we're going to do a Friedel-Crafts alkylation. You want to turn this into an acid chloride. So imagine you want to do KMnO4, and then give you an acid chloride. Oh wait, wait, oh, oh, actually, wait, never mind. This is something else. You cannot do a um, Friedel-Crafts reaction with phosgene. That actually just doesn't work out very well.
Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't have to erase all that to answer that question. If you wanted, to, if there, yeah, there's there's the the fastest way to get from here to something like here is probably doing just your generic aluminum trichloride potassium permanganate then SOCl2. Yeah, friel crafts reactions don't work well with um, phosgene or with this reagent either. Well, it looks like no one's chiming in, and it is towards the end of class. If people continue to have questions, um, I can be still responsive on Piazza. Um, I'll try to get some more practice problems. I need to come up with a few more. We got the exam made, and now I'm going to go sort through some of the other problems and see if I can put a few more practice problems up to do. It probably will not be the full length of an exam. Um, all the videos and stuff ended up eating more into my time than I thought. But um, have a good weekend. Let me know if there's anything else you need.